Hey, Cypher here. Woman King seems like a strange movie for me to review. Everyone has been clowning on it because of how inaccurate the premise is, so why even subject myself to that? Well, firstly, the Agoji or Amazons of Dahomey are a fascinating topic. They are the only time in recorded history of real-life Amazons, as in a warrior class composed of only women. Even more interesting, they existed during the heyday of the transatlantic slave trade on the west coast of Africa. Indeed, their existence was predicated on that slavery, as we will see. But I also wanted to see if all I had heard about the film's ridiculousness was true. All too often when it comes to movies on such difficult history as the slave trade, or really anything having to do with race and gender, the internet gets their hackles up about so-called inaccuracy specifically in a way they would never do about something like Braveheart. And you can see precisely why. The people who claim to defend history are the same people who complain about forced diversity when showing a truly diverse past. All too often, they're using historicism as a cudgel for their prejudices. But after a viewing of this, yeah, it's really bad. They make slavers into abolitionists and pretend to be righteous. It's, it's bad. <laughs> but unlike some fact checkers, I'm a historian and therefore unwilling to declare heroes and villains in such circumstances. You can still tell a story about people involved in slavery or any other abhorrent practice without condoning it. To me, this isn't any different from an Oliver Stone movie. It's just a laughably ignorant attempt at telling a story, revealing the filmmakers' contempt for their subject matter, and replacing history with their farcical nonsense at the expense of any semblance of credulity. It's just pandering to people too ignorant to understand how much of a disservice to history it is. Only fools defend it. Agogis were slave owners and slave traders, but even worse, they were slavers. The difference being, they were the ones abducting people and enslaving them, rather than simply owning and trading slaves. Their violence was substantially more deleterious, but they served a kingdom. Their service entailed slaving, but they were often slaves themselves, rendering this unworthy of moralistic judgment. It's time we go beyond good and evil, especially when talking about history. Also, I'm going to really screw up some of the pronunciations, but you should expect that anyways from most of my stuff. I read rather than listen most of the time, so yeah. Plus, these are a bunch of African names. Anyways, let's learn about who Agogis were. Today's episode is sponsored by my patrons and Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon makes delicious high-protein breakfast cereal. When I got the package, King certainly seemed excited to see it. All right, let's see what we got. Two of those, peanut butter, two of the chocolate ones, two of the fruity ones. Can't wait to try them. And there are more flavors than that such as maple waffle and blueberry muffin. Of the ones I got, it's a bit of a toss-up between two that I consider my favorites. One is the frosted flavor, which is like a pleasant vanilla that's sweet, while the other is the fruity flavor, which is a nice melody of fruits that is like having a kid's cereal again, but without the overly saccharine composition. This actually came just in time because I've been looking for like a midnight snack that's, you know, not too many calories. <laughs> if you know what I mean. One serving of Magic Spoon cereal has 13 or 14 grams of protein and only 4 or 5 grams of net carbs with zero sugar. So go to magicspoon.com slash cynicalhistorian and use the code cynicalhistorian to get $5 off an order. Thanks to them for sponsoring this episode and on with the show. Dahomey was a small West African kingdom that arose in the late 17th century in what is now central Benin. The Fon tribe comprised its ruling class, which centered power around palaces built across the Abami Plateau. 
They expanded across that plateau and south to the coast, conquering the kingdom of Waida in 1727. A year later, they ran into the Yoruba-controlled Oyo Empire, losing a series of wars from then until 1740 that made them tributaries to Oyo. The first recorded instance of Agogis, or all-female warriors that Europeans called Amazons, was in the early 18th century as palace guards. Fon palaces had a tradition of keeping women separate from men and strictly under the control of the ruling chief. This applied to Dahomey, but it is unclear how that transformed into a warrior class. Much like any king's guard, Agogis participated in warfare, but that was not their initial purpose. They were simply elite protectors of the monarch, raised as such from minority, being chosen from any number of backgrounds. They could be any girls sent to the king, whether natively rich, poor, or slave. As Dahomey developed into a regional power, they also developed traditions to exhibit their martial might. Most famous of these was the annual customs, which consisted of parading around wealth, doing military exercises, giving gifts to the various chiefs that comprised the kingdom, exhibiting the skulls of their enemies, and culminating in the sacrifice of normally around 500 slaves. But that number could rise over a thousand, depending on how opulent the king wanted to be that year. Since Agogis were present throughout these bloody festivities, they participated often to the astonishment of European visitors. Another spectacular instance of such traditional events was the gun custom, where they would line fawn musketeers from north to south along the Yoruba-controlled border, which is now Nigeria. Then they'd fire one shot after another into the air in a relay at the speed of sound. A further custom related to Fon tribal tradition was that villagers other than eunuchs were not allowed in the palace after dark, keeping women away from vision by separating them with palm leaves. When agogis became more prevalent in the 19th century, villagers were expected to avert their eyes as agogis passed. Dahomey kings had vast harems, but Agogis were not part of that. Though technically married to the king, they were celibate and raised purely as warriors. Even when confronted by French soldiers in the 1890s, these Amazons were renowned for their bravery, selflessness, and ferocity. In a martial society, such as Dahomey, that prided itself on the ability to vanquish and enslave enemies, Agogis were feared beyond any other unit in the army. They were the elite, just as most king's guards are. But in this case, they were composed of solely women who had trained all of their lives to be better than men on the battlefield. Throughout the 18th century, Agogis were a tiny force in the military, numbering only a few hundred. While Dahomey was an Oyo tributary, they had to send 41 slaves every year along with trying to maintain solvency through selling slaves to Europeans at Waida, taking advantage of the pre-existing European factories or slave trading forts throughout the coast. In order to pay tribute and keep their kingdom wealthy, they expanded northward. They'd regularly raid Mahi villages to capture slaves, making a ritualized schedule out of slave raiding. Recognizing the deleterious effects of rampant slaving, King Adandazan attempted to curtail slavery in the early 19th century by having fewer sacrifices at the annual customs, switching to agricultural goods, avoiding tribute to Oyo whenever possible, and selling fewer slaves to Europeans. This backfired when his brother, Gezo, conspired with a Brazilian slave trader to overthrow Adandazan in 1818 thereby continuing slavery in full force. Gezo then had to decide what to do with the king's guard. Instead of purging them like a Caesar removing Praetorians, he empowered them further, giving Agogi's political office and recruiting many more. By the 1840s, they numbered as many as 8,000. Clearly this helped maintain their loyalty, but it may have also been a practical decision, considering slaving had removed so much of Dahomey's men, leaving substantially more women in the kingdom. Agogis were still small in number at the beginning of Getzo's reign, but the Oyo Empire was crumbling. Dahomey took advantage and defeated them sometime in the late 1820s or early 30s. At the same time, many Western powers were outlawing the Atlantic slave trade. Britain and the United States even sent tiny fleets to patrol the African coast in a vain attempt to halt slave traders. 
Such efforts were fairly ineffectual at first, but once all of Europe and the Americas outlawed the practice by the 1830s, diplomatic pressure began to take effect. Dahomey remained obstinate, though. The last illegal slave ship to reach the U.S. came from Waida as late as 1860. In the 1850s, Britain concluded several blockades and treaties with Getzo to halt the trade, but he refused to stop it. Dahomey steadily switched to palm oil production, but still relied heavily on slave labor to produce it. Their exportation of slaves dwindled to non-existence in the 1860s, but that just meant that they used slave production for agriculture. They kept expanding throughout the 19th century with increasing Agoji involvement. Most spectacular were two failed attacks on Abiyakuta in 1853 and 1861, which substantially reduced Goji ranks. Throughout the late 19th century, Dahomey kept running into European colonies. By that time, Agochis were substantial parts of the army. In 1890 and 94, France subjugated the kingdom in two quick yet brutal wars. Rumors of Agoji insurgency continued for years, though not in any contemporary sources. France officially dissolved the Kingdom of Dahomey in 1904, even though the king had been a vassal for a decade. With its dissolution went the Agoji as an official designation, the last of whom died in the 1970s. At first, there was very little study of pre-colonial African kingdoms, partially because of the ongoing white supremacist project of nationalist historians to portray them as backward savages. This has changed in the last few decades. Plenty of scholars study the topic now, and there has been a real attempt at pulling these stories from the grave. For understanding Dahomey, I had plenty to draw upon, but for the story of Agoji specifically, I had basically one book to read. With such rare exceptions, military history hasn't advanced past the orthodox colonialist view of backward savages. Military history is absurdly stagnant in the Western world, so historians should get on this already. That being said, there's still so much in these works to pull from that it's confusing how this movie even got made. How do you make slavers into abolitionists, and then pretend you're making some serious message about racial power? And the Americans have seen if you want to hold a people in chains, one must first convince them that they are meant to be bound. Yeah, that's said by King Gezo, someone who came to power for the sake of upholding slavery and made Agoji's an integral part of that system. They're trying to tell this whole story of black empowerment in a way that's laughable to anyone who has even the most cursory knowledge of the topic. But let's at least talk about what it gets correct before I tear it apart. Many of the customs of Dahomey and Agoji's are shown with interesting details. They show the whole palm line of strictly gendered separation in the palaces. Beyond this wall, this is a palace of women. Although it appears that there's only one palace when there were actually many. The movie is also the first time we see pre-colonial African politics accurately depicted. They of course refuse to show the parts that might disgust audiences, such as human sacrifice and the massive amounts of skulls on display, only showing a few and acting like the numerous tales from several angles and archaeological evidence is somehow overblown. Those are the heads. Some of the men who raided our village. But at least it's something? When has Hollywood depicted a pre-colonial sub-Saharan kingdom in any detail whatsoever? The closest I can think of was Amistad, though admittedly that was far more accurate for its very brief portrayal. Uh, what else? They do show that the Oyo Empire kept Dahomey in tributary status, and that they were eventually defeated, which is basically the key events the movie depicts. There's also this mention of Gezo's involvement with Francisco Felix de Souza. Obviously, that's only implied, but it's at least something. But yeah, there really isn't much to praise otherwise. 
From the very outset of the film, we see this weird attempt to depict Dahomey as the underdog and avoid anything that might portray the kingdom in a negative light. They pretend Oyo's were trying to annihilate Dahomey, which would be ridiculous given their tributary status. This raid on a Mahi village is said to be an attempt to free their own people. Where are the prisoners? Where are our people? That's idiotic, because these were slave raids. They barely even show Agoji's taking prisoners. Also, notice a surprising absence of firearms and men. Agoji's were a far smaller force in the 1820s when this is supposed to be happening, and men were the primary Dahmian soldiers. They seem to be attempting to show Oyo's were the more technologically superior state, even depicting them as being the only ones with horses. Horses. That can only mean all your soldiers. Yet, by the 1820s, Dahomey had all of that and was in the process of defeating Oyo, so this underdog crap makes no sense. There's also this odd bent to show Agoji's as being the primary warriors of the kingdom. This was never the case, even when they numbered in the thousands. They only began to substantially grow in number after the Oyo Empire was defeated, so depicting this time frame like that is even stranger. Through that, there's this really dumb battle scene with a bunch of Hollywood single combat nonsense. Funniest part is when she catches a bullet with her dagger. I don't know why the filmmakers did that, but it's just silly. An even stranger inaccuracy is the choice of location for where Oyo's control. They call it Waida. The real location was the key Dahomeyan slave market. It was not in the control of the Oyo Empire. So what are they even trying to say here? But this is related to the most startling inaccuracy. Woman King tries to make Agogis into abolitionists. This is outrageously preposterous. Agogis were slavers, through and through. They never stopped owning slaves until France abolished the practice in 1894. While Dahomey steadily ceased to export slaves as they transitioned to palm oil production in the mid-19th century, they used slaves for that agriculture. The movie even tries to act like that switch entails abolition. The slave trade is the reason we prosper. But at what price? We have other things to sell. Gold, palm oil. Which is patently absurd. This is not the way. This is the way. This is the way. That gets even worse as they clearly try to blame the slave trade on Europeans. The white man has brought immorality here. When a goji even unironically calls a Portuguese mulatto a slaver, Go back to Ida, slaver. The Portuguese were slave traders, and Agogis were the slavers. So reality is just the opposite of what this movie is trying to depict. All that denialism culminates in a scene of destroying the fort at Waida. They self-righteously massacre the slave traders. Nothing of the sort ever happened, and Dahomey perpetuated slavery well after Europeans attempted to halt it. That sours any catharsis of this moment. Then they follow it up with this whole speech. We have ended the reign of the Oyo Empire. The Europeans and the Americans have seen if you want to hold a people in chains, one must first convince them that they are meant to be bound. We join them in becoming our own oppressor, but no more. If we understand that power, we will be limitless. Notice the explicit call about Americans and keeping people down by convincing them that they aren't powerful. The hypocrisy of such a speech in a film about slavers is just... I don't know. I'm kinda speechless. How does something so terrible get made? It's straight up atrocity denial. No better than anyone else who peddles that kind of conspiracism. By whitewashing Agogis and Dahomey in this film, I've had to rethink their fictionalization in Black Panther, which was integral to getting this movie greenlit in the first place. It's kind of the same problem as with Hamilton, where the movie's message is contradicted by the history it's erasing, though obviously Hamilton is significantly better. 
At the end of Woman King, there's this strange performative after credits scene where they name check Brianna Taylor as if she's a spiritual agoji who died in battle. Sisters in blood, you fall and now you rise. Kesia. Brianna. Which is just in astoundingly poor taste. I don't know what to make of that. But it leaves quite a bad impression once you know what Dahemi Zagoji's actually represented. They could have told a good story here, but all I can say with it is yikes. Two, three. <laughs> Kid comes rushing down at suicide. <laughs> okay, you're coming up here then. Say hello. Say hello. Oh, thank you. Boy, well, somebody just wanted to be pet, huh? King, stop that. King, no. <laughs>